So we have a special treat uh, today. Um, uh, Brad Rose has been a part of our congregation for the last few months, and uh, Brad, Brad is the, the leader of the local Young Life organization, which is an uh, organization that partners with churches, parachurch organizations is what they call these. They're like Christian organizations that come alongside the church and do like a special type of ministry. And so Brad's ministry is to youth in our community. And uh, I have greatly enjoyed getting to know Brad over the last few months. And so I want to invite him up here now. And he's going to share with us today, kind of continue in our series on Acts. So welcome, Brad. Thank you. All right. Is this? Yeah, it's on. Okay. I could, uh, I could barely contain the excitement with my Backstreet Boys microphone that I have on this morning. <laughs> Everyone obviously noticed me as I was walking through the lobby. I look very official. Uh, with this on this morning. Um, I'm going to apologize for two reasons. Uh, first of all, this is the first time I've ever done this. I've never been an official preacher man, and so if I'm bad, I'm sorry. I'm like, what do you do? There's always, there's always next week. And the, the, the second thing is uh, last night, my wife and I decided to go visit Dr. Adam. You might know him. He goes to our church here. I don't know him very well, uh, but we had a bit of a scare last night. An alarm went off about 1130 in the morning, I was ready to you know, grab the wife and kid and explode through our window out of a flaming building like in the movies, uh, but it was all just a little bit of a scare. Um, but we were up late. We got home about three in the morning, so I'm a little bit tired this morning. Anyways, now that we got that out of the way, uh, as Jeremy said, my name is Brad Rose. Uh, I've met a few of you, but uh, I'm just getting to know some of you. Uh, I was thinking about this. Jeremy said we've been here for a few months. I actually don't know how long I've been here. I think, uh, honestly, Katie and I slept in one morning. And we miss church, and we're like, oh, what do we do now? And we're like, I think there's a little one down the road that starts a little bit later. Let's try that. <laughs> and so we did. And, and we uh, have thoroughly enjoyed our time here. Uh, just like Jeremy said, I've uh, really, really enjoyed getting to know Jeremy and a bunch of you here. Um, a little bit about myself. I'm married to Katie and my son, Elliot, and he's already acting up. Four, <laughs> four weeks old, and he still doesn't get it. Unbelievable. Um, but I've lived here my whole life. I've lived in, in Port Sydney. I've lived in three different houses, but all within the village. I don't stray far. I'm a local boy, uh, and I love it here. I don't feel like I want to move. Uh, it's a great place to live. And as Jeremy said, uh, I work for a Christian youth organization called Young Life. And uh, some fun facts about Young Life. We've actually, uh, we're in over 100 countries. We've been around for 75 years. We have 35 camps across the world. And some of you are probably going, how have I never heard of that? Because that's what I did. I had never heard of it. My wife, Katie, uh, grew up going to Young Life. Uh, and basically, like Jeremy said, we, uh, kind of our big shtick in Young Life, we're kind of this very specific thing where we say, we're going to go into the world of kids. So we don't, we often say, we don't wait for kids to clean up, grow up, or show up. We're going to go find that kid who says, I don't want to go to church at all. I don't even believe in God. And we think, perfect, that's an awesome place for us to start. And we get to know them uh, and love them and become friends with them. And we do that through a variety of different ways. Um, but I think my favorite part is just, uh, we call it contact work in Young Life, and it's just where we, we go into the world of kids, and we spend a ton of time there, whether that's through coaching or horseback riding or coffee shops, uh, whatever that might be, we spend a ton of time with kids. Out of that, we have weekly events we do. We call it club. Uh, it's a chance for us. Uh, it's a place for a Christian kid to bring their non-Christian friend where they can learn about who Jesus is. Uh, we keep it very introductory. We have another group that we call campaigners, uh, and that's more of uh, your stereotypical Bible study. We meet at Tuesday mornings at Christine's place, uh, and we also have camps as well. So if you want to hear anything else about Young Life, you can come track me down after. That's not why I'm here this morning, is to give my spiel on Young Life. Um, Jeremy and April uh, graciously took an interest in Katie and I in our life. We found out that ministry, uh, when we're both in it together, can be a little bit hard, and they said, hey, we'd love to learn about Young Life. And we thought, great, why don't you come to our winter camp? That's the best way to learn about Young Life. Their water heater exploded. They couldn't come. And so he said, hey, can we come to a club one night? I said, that sounds great. And little did I know, I thought that Jeremy was there, you know, taking a genuine interest in my ministry. But really, about 24 hours later, I got the call from him. Hey, Brad, you did it okay speaking. Would you like to speak at church? And I, <laughs> so I, think, I thought it was like kind of like an NHL scout. He was just out at the minor leagues just seeing, hey, can this guy string together a few sentences so maybe I could take a week off, which I understand as a guy who, 
who runs weekly events, it's nice to have a break. So I was uh, honored that he asked me, and I've thoroughly enjoyed the process. Of, uh, he, I think we could all agree we have a very bright pastor, a man who thinks very deeply about you. Yeah, we can clap for him. Um, so you may think that was an easy thing for me to do, just to say, oh, can you speak at church? Sure, no problem. But to be honest, I thought, my immediate thought is no. <laughs> like, I was like, well, who am I? Like, who am I really that I could get up and share? And for half an hour, I've been given the gift of gab, but when it, when it comes to spiritual things, I thought, oh, geez, I don't know. And you might say, well, Brad, you work in ministry. Like, it, it, it must be easy. And I got to be honest, that's a saying that's, that's drove me a little bit nuts since I started working for Young Life. You're like, oh, you're in ministry. I'm like, yeah, I guess. But, like, what does that mean? What does it mean for the rest of the world? They just get to take it off, and it's like, oh, I'm a Christian, but I just get to do whatever I want. But, oh, you're in ministry. And so I, I, I've been wrestling with that a little bit. Uh, and so... Um, I think it's interesting because if uh, I still work for Young Life September 1st, 2015. If you called me a week earlier, you would have said, Brad, what do you do? I would have said, I'm a landscaper. I put rocks in the ground and I dig dirt. <laughs> and then September 1st, you call me, what do you, oh, I'm in ministry. <laughs> and it's like, well, what changed between August 31st and September 1st? Nothing. Nothing changed about who I was. I didn't, wasn't all of a sudden this spiritual holy man. And so... It's uh, been an interesting thing that I've been thinking about because I think in that moment, I, I definitely did know that I had a call. I felt that God uh, really put something in my heart where he said, you need to go work for Young Life. But that didn't mean that all of a sudden I knew what I was doing because I didn't. And I look back now and I go, wow, I really didn't know what I was doing. Um, and I think, you know, you could say, well, uh, what did you just fake it till you make it? A little bit. <laughs> but Young Life does luckily have a great history of excellent training. And so I learned a lot of the tools uh, in my training that I could do to go out and be in ministry, as they say. Um, but just because you have the tools, it's like a carpenter. If I have a, just because I have a table saw doesn't mean I know how to build a house. All right? And so uh, it took a lot of practice, and it's been something that I've been working on a lot in my life. And I have some quite funny stories. I think when I, the word evangelism, I heard it as a young kid, go out and share your faith. Evangelism, I didn't even really understand what that word meant. But when uh, I have a unique relationship, I feel like, with evangelism, because when I first started... I thought, okay, evangelism means I have to get my friends to behave well. <laughs> then, maybe, if they behave well enough, God will love them. Like, that's kind of how it maybe started to work when I was young. And I realized, well, maybe that's, that's not quite it. So let, let me try and take it a step further. And I think as I got older, I can remember working for my dad, landscaping, and I thought, oh, I know how I can evangelize. I'm going to put the Christian radio station on when my friends get in the truck. Eh? The boys are going to come in, the perfect song's going to come on, and then they're going to get to know who God is. That didn't work that well. I can remember, I'm like, okay, I've got to take a step further. And there was this guy who's a dear friend of mine that I work with, and I thought, I really need to share my faith with this guy. Like, I need, I, I, I need to, I'm going to, I'm going to do it. I'm going to give him, you know, John 3.16. Here we go. All right? <laughs> And so I remember we were just, at, we, it was about a, an, an hour drive to the job site, and I'm nervous. I'm like, I'm going to do it. I'm, when we park, I'm going to tell him the gospel. I'm going to really do this. He's going to become a Christian this morning. This is going to be amazing. <laughs> and I started talking, and I'm like, oh, boy, this isn't going well. Like, I don't know where I'm going. I don't really know what I'm saying. And after he kind of looked at me, he's like, okay, like, can we go to work now? I'm like, yeah, let's go to work. Like, totally. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, now I'm in ministry. So now I work for Young Life. I'm the spiritual holy man. And about a, a month into my job with Young Life, all their new staff have to go to a gospel proclamation course. And I thought, this is perfect. Like, I'm, I'm going to learn how. I obviously know how now because I'm in ministry. I've been through all that other stuff. And the first thing that he did in the exercise that struck fear into every single staff person was there. He said, all right, you're going to turn to the person next to you. And we're like, mm. Right, like, who did I sit beside? Did I pick the wrong person to sit beside? And he said, I want you, you have 30 to 45 seconds, and you're going to share the gospel with your friend. All right, they're not going to say anything to you. They're going to pretend like they've never heard this before, and then they're going to repeat back what you said to them. And I thought, oh, I got this. Like, I've been through the whole thing. I know what I'm doing now. And I remember I started sharing, like, so there's this guy, and his name's Jesus, and he came, and then there's a problem because we're bad, and there's sin, and, uh, and, uh, and I get into this thing, and she stops, and she's like, so you're telling me that Jesus is an alien? And I'm like, ah! Like, all right, so I say all this where it's like, it's hard. Sometimes it's really hard to share our faith. Like we, you know, we, we are in a faith where we believe in a virgin birth. That's difficult. 
that's a difficult place to start with people. So uh, as simple as the, as the gospel is, sometimes it, it can be very, very hard to communicate, and especially uh, to friends, coworkers, people around us who know nothing about this. And so as we've been journeying through Acts, uh, and Jeremy asked uh, if I'd like to speak, I feel like he was gracious to me and gave me a passage where Paul is in the world of people. <laughs> and I thought, ah, that's pretty easy for me. Like, it wasn't like predestination, Brad. Can you figure that out for the Sunday morning? It was something easy. And I think it has continually uh, challenged me as I look through this stuff is how do I share my faith? How do I uh, do that every day, right where I am? I, I work with people every day. I go to the similar gas station, the Hortons, whatever it is. Um, and I think we get a really cool chance uh, in Acts 17 to see Paul uh, start sharing the gospel with a group of people in Athens who know absolutely nothing about Christianity. And I think that it's a very unique opportunity for us uh, if you call yourself a Christian and you are thinking about how I can share my faith. I think this is a great, great opportunity. I have really enjoyed learning about this. So we pick up this man with this man named Paul. Paul was Saul, and he became Paul, which always confused me when I first heard about what's with the name switches. I don't really understand. I'm Brad. Always have been Brad. But anyway, <laughs> sometimes I think about a name switch. That might be nice. But uh, for now, he, so he's Paul now. Uh, and he was a guy who was responsible for writing a very impressive amount of the New Testament, excluding the Gospels. Like, this guy was pretty legit. Like, he, he wrote a lot of the stuff that 2,000 years ago uh, we still read. Uh, at one point in his life, he was a Jewish Pharisee, which meant he loved the rules. He was a real stickler for them. It was like me in my early days of evangelism. Just make them behave. Do the right thing. And that's kind of who Paul was. He was a Roman citizen who spoke and wrote in Greek. And in my, Jeremy gave me all these fancy books with Greek words and all these fancy things that I could read about. And I came across something that was very funny about Paul. I never knew this. It's in a book called The Acts of St. Paul. And this is how they describe him. Okay, so Paul is a man of small stature. And I'm like, not bad. Yeah, small stature. I'm, yeah, I'm digging Paul a little bit here. I, I, it says he has a bald head, crooked legs, and a good state of body. I don't know what that means. With eyebrows meeting in the middle and a nose somewhat hooked. And I was like, that's, like, that's Paul? That's, I, first, I guess I, I was born, you know, 21st century Hollywood has messed up my mind. I'm like, I figured Paul was like, you know, six foot five, 225, walking around and big strapping man. But... No, Paul was just this very average, simple dude. Uh, and I just thought that was funny. I immediately pictured Mr. Burns, any Simpsons fans. I'm like, oh, that's Mr. Burns probably. That's, that's who I think it is. So anyways, I think that makes the Bible a little bit more of a reality where I go, oh, okay, yeah, he was a normal guy. Um, the other thing about Paul is he was a guy who actually at one point in his life did really, really horrible things to Christians. Like terrible. He was a murderer. Like, he actually killed these people. And so, when you think about that, like, that's who the guy is, but yet God used him. Paul ha had this unique opportunity to meet Jesus on the road to Damascus. It's a story in the Bible. And that's what I think I love about Jesus, when he has an interaction with people, that their life becomes dramatically different. It doesn't matter where they were, what they were doing, how they were coming from, that when they meet with Jesus uh, and experience his love and his freedom, uh, we see huge, huge change. And we certainly see that uh, in Paul. And so Paul actually becomes now, he's an apostle. Like he's this guy, he's in ministry. Paul becomes that guy where he's now giving his life despite all the things that had happened where he'd come from that he was sold out for Jesus. And he thought, I got to tell everybody about this guy. And so uh, Paul's in Athens, uh, as we read about that uh, by the time that Paul had arrived there, the city they said was about 500 years past his prime. So he'd kind of, you know, had this big influx, then it went down. I picture like Detroit. We're in Detroit, maybe. I don't know. And then, um, you know, it says that there was probably about 30,000 people there. And it was a city, as I talked about, uh, that was without the knowledge of the love story of Jesus. They knew nothing about it. And so we're going to pick up that story, uh, if you want to follow along. I think Aiden's going to put them on the back of the screen, maybe. Um, but I think it's interesting because Paul is kind of on this journey with some of his buddies named Silas and Timothy. They're in Thessalonica. Things don't go well. He moves on to Berea. Things still don't really go that well. And I think this, to me, seems hilarious because it says, the believers immediately sent Paul to the coast. But Silas and Timothy, his friends who he was traveling with, they stay in Berea. Those who escorted Paul brought him to Athens and then left with instructions for Silas and Timothy to join him as soon as possible. And so I think it's funny because you get this picture where it's like, 
Things aren't going well. He moves. Things aren't going well again. And then all of a sudden, they just like, it seems like it's like an accident. They're like, just find him a safe house. Just stuff him in Athens for a while. I don't know. That city seems like there's not much going on there. And he's left there. And Paul's just kind of on his own. And so uh, as we pick up the story, um, it says, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly t- distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he gets there, and there's something that I love about Paul. He, when, he, when he arrives in Athens, he doesn't say, oh, great, I got some time off. This is great. The boys are back in Berea doing their thing. I'm in Athens. Not much going on here. Uh, but, but Paul, he does the opposite. Right away, he goes to work. And he said, oh, you know what? I got to look around this city. I think it could have been very easy for Paul uh, just to say, well, you know, they're gone. Maybe I'll just find a Starbucks, throw on the Wi-Fi, catch up on Netflix. Like, I don't know. Just wait for Once they arrive here, then... That's when I'll do the work. But no, he says right away that he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. And these idols uh, that they talk about in this story, uh, they figured that they're, so these were like gods, basically, things that they worshipped. Uh, and it, it says that there was probably likely around 70 to 75,000 different idols. And I thought, whoa, I'm just trying to figure out who Jesus is. If I had 73,000 other different options. This has got to become confusing. And, and there's a saying that some of the kids that I work with, I don't know if it's cool anymore or not, but they're like, oh, you do you, bro. Right? Like this idea of, oh, man, whatever's good for you, whatever's right, that's awesome. You do you. And I think that's what was going on here in Athens, where there was like all these people where it was like, I like that God. That seems okay. But I wanted to tweak a few things. So, huh, check out this one. This is what I created. And so uh, it's this Thing, and I think uh, we would probably have the notion, I think sometimes we could be guilty as Christians to go, I can't believe you would follow anything else but, but Jesus, you know? And, and I think that maybe we could pick up, it says that Paul was greatly distressed. And I think, um, when I think of that word distressed, there was, uh, I think sometimes we could think that he must have been angry. That Paul must have got there and been like, oh my gosh, these idiots, I can't believe what they're doing. But I don't think that's what Paul does at all. I think it, it could be also translated as that Paul was provoked or that he was stirred up. Right? And I think that there's something in that. Or I did think it. I think it upset Paul. And I think it upset them because he, I, I can't help but think he would have thought, oh man, they're missing it. Right? They're not really understanding that there's all these different things that they're working on, but they're missing the one true God, the God that I met and the God that I know. And so I think it stirred him up with some anger, but also like a call to action, where he went, okay, I'm not done here. I'm not just going to stop. I'm not just going to get angry. I'm not going to just judge them. And we pick up. So it says that. So he it says he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. Then it says a group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? While others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. And so, who are these guys? The Epicureans and the Stoics. I guess, like, do we have Epicurean and Stoic philosophers today? I don't know. I don't think so. So I had to do some research with Jeremy's fancy books. And uh, it says that the Epicureans, uh, they believe that the cosmos, so the world, was a result of an accident. Right? And that God, the gods, if there was any, lived an undisturbed life of happiness without interfering in the affairs of the world. So essentially, they were atheists. They were people who said, yeah, you know what? Big bang, we all ended up here. There might be gods, but they're not relevant to me. Uh, and so that's kind of who those people were. Then there was the Stoics. And this made me laugh a little bit because it says the Stoics, uh, that virtue is sufficient for human happiness. So they describe virtue as the skill of putting other things and other people to correct use. They believe, oh, if I could just do that, then that would be good enough. Uh, And then it says, nothing except virtue is good, and that emotions are always bad. And I laughed because I thought, I think they're talking about men today. (laughs) Oh, if I can just work hard, emotions are bad, then everything's good, right? Like, I kind of pictured that's, that's who we're dealing with. So I think, though it's a fancy name, a different name, something we're not used to, I think they were very similar to the people that we would probably interact with today. There's lots of people who say, yeah, I think we're here because of an accident. I don't really believe in this stuff. I'm just trying to be a good person. If I be good enough, if I do enough good, then everything will be fine. And so uh, it says that uh, then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, which was the Areopagus was this fancy place where, uh, you know, all the who's who in the zoo got together and they talked and they debated and and came up with different 
uh, things and ideas where they, and they said to him, may we know this new teaching that it is you are presenting. You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears and we would like to know what they mean. And so I think it's cool because I don't know how long Paul is here. It doesn't say. But what I do know is Paul spent some time in the city and he got to know them. He looked around. He saw what they were worshiping, different gods, things that were going on. Uh, and I think by the time they got here that Paul obviously must have had a relationship with them. There was something that Paul did where they thought, you know what, let's hear more from this guy, right? He's not this, this jerk who's coming and telling us we're, you know, idiots. He's like, no, he obviously, something about his presentation, they said, hey, Paul, buddy, come on over here. Like, let's, we want to hear a little bit more about this. And it says, all the Athenians and the foreigners who live there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. And so... They just, uh, you know, I picture when I was a kid, I grew up playing hockey, and there's this group of boys, this, these older men, who always sat in the corner of the coffee shop that we went for breakfast after, and you just picture them. They're like, oh, well, did you hear about so-and-so, and the mayor did this, and the road did that, and blah, 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 whatever they talked about all morning. I think that's similar to what was going on here, where there's this group of people, and they, they were trying to figure it out. There was something in their heart where they thought, we got to keep talking about this. See, there's all these different things, but, but we gotta, we got to keep learning more. And so finally... Uh, they invite him in, and then Paul, he, we, we see him, he stands up and he gets his big chance. He gets his chance to share. And so then it says, Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship, and this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. And I love that. I think Paul, he kind of, he walks around and he doesn't just start shaming them. He says, hey, uh, you know, I see that in every way you're very religious. I think uh, this could potentially be like, uh, maybe translate, I see that in every way you're very spiritual. You're open to these things, right? Like I, I can see that as I walk around, there's quite a few different options to choose from. You guys seem to be into spirituality. There's lots of different idols that you're worshiping. Um, but he says, I think this is great. He says, uh, I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. And I think that was brilliant of Paul, where he looks around and he says, look, that's where I can start with them. They're talking about this unknown God. I think, you know, you hear them, they're debating constantly, day after day, searching and looking, but there's just this one, I feel like that's off to the side, and they're like, I don't know, we just throw that one over there, the unknown God. Like, we don't really know. And we know that about Athens. Like, we know that this was a city where they knew nothing about God. And so Paul says, hey, I even saw, I noticed, and amongst your 70,000 other things, that there was an unknown God. And, and he says, hey, I want to tell you about him. I want to tell you about this guy, because I, I think it's worth getting to know. And so he says this, and I want you to, uh, as, you're, as you're reading this, I think there's lots of, we see an awesome opportunity where Paul shares the gospel. This thing that I have struggled with, he, you know, he's really doing it. He's, give, he's doing his evangelism with these people. I want you to watch, or kind of listen as, it's, uh, as I'm explaining this to you, because I think there's, there's some differences that we see compared to some of the other gospel proclamations that we see in the Bible. So here it is. He says, The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man... He made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. And poor Paul, uh, some of the scholars, the smart people that use all the big fancy words as I was reading Jeremy's fancy books, uh, they kind of get after Paul a little bit on this one, where they say, you know what? Because there's something, there's something that's much different about that gospel proclamation. If you'll notice, a lot of them, they say, you know, as it was written, and then they reference some Old Testament scripture. As it was written, da 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 But Paul doesn't do that here. And so some of them go, oh, was Paul losing it? Was he losing his edge? Finally, oh, that old guy, look, he's watering it down. He's not bringing scripture into it. And I think Paul was sitting there going, what's the point? These people have never read it. They've never read the Bible before. I could reference something, but they're not going to have a clue what I'm talking about. And so I think Paul and his wisdom is very smart where he starts to put these words into terms that they can understand, things that make sense. And as I'm reading it, 
as you go back to it, it says, the God who made the world and everything in is the Lord of heaven and earth. And I immediately go, wait a minute, I recognize that. Genesis, right? He doesn't say to them, as it is written in Genesis, because they're like, what's Genesis? Right? He just says, hey, there's a God who made the world. He talked about from one man, he made all the nations. Who could that man be? I wonder, Adam, also in Genesis. So we see this uh, really cool way where Paul, he takes out the Christianese. <laughs> That's one of the things we talk a lot about in Young Life, where we have these kids who we can use a lot of words like evangelism, where someone who's outside of the faith goes, what on earth is evangelism? I have no idea what you're talking about. And I think that Paul does an amazing, amazing job here taking all that stuff out of it. And then I think he does something even more clever at the end. He says, for in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. And I think there's something so significant about that line where he says, as some of your own poets have said. And now some of us could be going, not only is he not referencing scripture, he's talking about their poets. Like this guy's out of control, man. No one's ever gonna come to faith if we don't start slamming the Bible at them, man. We gotta let them know. Um... But I think where he says to him, in that moment, I think it brings this kind of like, I think it probably would have put this like connection to them, right? Where they would have gone, wait a minute. Oh yeah, our poets did say that. And taking what you said about this God who created all this, ah, aha. Like I think maybe I start to understand a little bit about what you're talking about. He, he's kind of contextualizing this. And so I think as an example of this for us, like how, what, what do I mean by this? I think uh, Katie came home a couple of years ago uh, at a job that, uh, from the job that she was working at, and she said, oh, like there's, you know, there's management stuff, and it's shifting, and there's this new person that might come in, and I'm really nervous because I don't want them to come in, and, and because, you know, if they're the one, I really like my boss right now, and she's going on and on, and I'm like Mr. Optimistic in our relationship. We say if we were dwarves, Katie's doubtful, and I'm hopeful. And so I'm like, oh, honey, you're overreacting. It's fine. Like, what's the big deal? This is right. It'll just, you know, new boss. Everything's going to be fine. And she says, no, Brad, imagine this. And she goes, remember that person so-and-so that you worked with? I'm like, uh-huh. She's like, what if they became your boss? And I went, oh. Like in that moment, like, now I see what you're talking about. That wouldn't be that good. And so I think that's exactly what he does here where he says, as some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. I think that's where they, these guys probably would have gone, oh, I think now I understand what you're talking about, Paul. And then he goes in a little bit further now and he starts to get um, a little bit personal with them, probably leaving them starting to feel a little bit uncomfortable. It says, therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. And they're probably going, huh? Like looking around, like all the different sculptures that they have around. He's like, yeah, see all those things? I don't think that's true. Like, I see what you're doing. If God created us, if he's the one who created us, what makes us think that we can recreate him? How can we come up with this idea about who God is? And then he says, in the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. And there it is, Repent. <laughs> Like that word that I think of, you know, a, you know, a Christian, repent from your sin. It's like this, like, wow, what do you mean repent? Like, oh, I think that's where we start to scare people off a little bit. But I think, I love how Paul does this because he says um, that in the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. And I think repent, uh, what he's talking about here is it's more, it's not about their behavior, right? It's not about how they talk what they're wearing, different things like that. He's saying something in your heart has to change, that you need a different viewpoint. And he's saying, guys, but I'm saying that this is all of us. Trust me, if, if you knew my history, I don't have a great history with God and the Christians, right? Like, I, I got a lot of things to be ashamed about, but, but I met Jesus, and my heart was completely changed. And he's saying, God's calling all of us to that. He wants that for all of us. And he goes on, uh, to say that, um, for he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. And again, we see that inclusive language. For he has set a day when he will judge all the world. Not just you guys. I'm not here saying you're the only bad ones. We're saying all of us. All of us are in need of God. Um, and I think it's interesting because there's something else that he says. He has given proof of this by everyone by raising him from the dead. If you grew up in church... You'd have heard Jesus died and then rose again, and you know now he, he lives in heaven, and that's a very normal thing for us to hear, that Jesus rose from the dead. Um, these guys, the, the Greeks at the time, completely, like the, the fact that when life was over, that was it. 
done. Like the fact that somebody would be risen from the dead uh, was just not even something that they thought about, right? Like it was just, and, and it, it breaks my heart because there's just no hope. There's no hope in that city, right? And so I think when you contrast that of, oh, Paul's watering it down. He's not using the Bible. He's doing all these things. He even quoted the poets and all he just said, all he was talking about that Jesus was raised from the dead. He doesn't go any further on. I think Paul left these guys with a lot to think about. Right, where he started, and, and he, he said, and he spent more time, and I, I don't know what happens after this exactly, but I, I, I just think that Paul, he, he must have spent more time with them. Because right, as it goes on, it says, um, when they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some sneered at him, but others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. Paul, we've never heard any of this before. Can we hear you again? And he says, at that, Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed and among them was Dionysus. Dionysus? Jeremy and I worked on this. I missed. I don't know what it is. That guy, D. We'll call him D. A member of the Areopagus, also a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. And so I think it's uh, there's so much to learn from that. There's so much beauty in that, and just how um, I think Paul really became somebody who was uh, you know a great learner of their culture, and that he took a lot of time to talk about what that meant for them. And so. I think we have to think about what does this all mean for us, right? Like, well, okay, Brad, that's great. That's a good story. I don't have many Epicureans or Stoics around, so I'll, uh, what, what, do we, what do we do with all this? And I think some of the takeaways, some of the things that I was thinking about uh, as I read this, uh, the first thing that I love about what happened, I talked about this at the start, I don't think we can take uh, for granted the opportunities that we have while we're in the waiting Right? Like I think for a lot of us, I, I don't know about you, I'm a very, I'm a hyper-stimulated person, <laughs> very rambunctious. I like excitement. I want like, some, I want fireworks, like boom, explosions, excitement, bring it on. Like I want cool things to happen. But I think we spend a lot of our time in the waiting, right? And I love that we see Paul, it, like, like I talked about, it seems like it was like an accident that he was there, right? But no, he didn't treat it like that at all. He says, okay, I'm in Athens. Here I am. I want to get to know the people. Let's see what's going on in this city. I want to know what it's all about. And I think that that's true for us. Um, and I think that the question we ask is, what are the realities right now that you're living in where you feel like you're in the waiting? Oh, I just need something, you know? Maybe for you, it's like you're thinking about, oh, I just, you know, where I live, my house just isn't quite good enough. My neighbors are annoying. They got this dog who won't stop barking. The other guy's got crap all over their lawn. And if I only could get just a little bit more money and move away from these guys, then my life would be better. Right? And maybe you do need to do that. I don't know. I don't know how loud this dog is. I don't know how much stuff's on their lawn. But <laughs> in the meantime, why does God have you there? What are you doing there? Like, why does God have you in that very place? Why does he have the people that you're living beside? Or maybe uh, it could be something like that you're thinking about your job, right? Like, it's a similar situation with a job. Oh, my job's all right. We're just kind of getting through, waiting for something else. Like, I just need something that's better. And again, Maybe you do need something that's better. I'm not here telling you what you should do with your job. But what I am saying is when you go to work tomorrow morning, who's that person you work with every day? Who's that person that you kind of just walk by? Oh, they're a little bit annoying. I don't really worry about them. They seem a bit grumpy. Um, how can we be like Paul and take that time to want to get to know them? Right? Start asking them some questions. For some of you younger kids that are here, maybe you're in public school and you're like, oh, gosh, I just got to get to high school. I've been here long enough, man. I got this figured out. I'm ready to move on. Bring on high school. Uh, for you guys to think about, who are the kids in your class? Who's that kid that's been in your class for the last eight years, and you barely even, do they even have a sibling? I don't know, right? Like that you could take time. That I think God's placed you there for a reason. Same thing for high school kids, right? Like there's something I'm learning about this year, senioritis, right? They say, oh, I got a bad case of senioritis. I'm accepted in my school. Got my classes all done. I'm ready to go. I just got to get out of here. Right? Like, I got to move on. Enjoy high school, I will say. It's a great time. You don't realize how good you have it. But also think about <laughs> the fact that, you know, I think there's a reason that you're there. I really honestly believe that. And so I think that um, my point of all of that is that I think we find ourselves in the waiting a lot. Where we're in the waiting, life might not feel that exciting, it's a little bit mundane. And, and my encouragement to you guys is start to pray about that. Like, God, what do you have for me? What do you have for me uh, in this place? I think another thing that's really cool uh, that we see with Paul, it, it feels like he has a, an intimate connection with the Spirit. Like, it just seems like he, 
a prompting comes, and, and he just like, moves. he's like, yeah, yeah, like, let's keep going on this. So like, what I mean by that, for some of you who might be trying to think, you know, something for me, I'm like, what is the Spirit like? How do I understand the Spirit? God, I get, you know, the Father, everything's good, but the Spirit seems hard for me to understand. And so that's something that I've really been working on my, in my life. And I think the one instance where God uh, started to talk to me about what the Spirit was like happened with a friend of mine. His name's Chris. This was back when I was single. You know, Katie wasn't around, no Elliot. And we were driving through town. We were in Huntsville, came over the bridge, came up to the lights right by Family Place. And we see this kid, like, his, he bailed off his bike, and he fell off, and he, it was like a scene out of a movie, like this little punk kid, and he's, oh, and he's, him, he's like stomping on his bike, and it's not working, and we, we laughed. Like, it was just so funny for some reason. This kid was just kicking his bike, and it's down, and we're like, look at this guy. Like, he's so upset. And then the light goes green, and literally within, like, you know, five seconds, Chris and I both stop. We're like, we need to go help that guy. <laughs> what the heck was that about? Why are we laughing? Something stirred inside of us, and we go, oh, it's just, oh, what, are we just good people? No, I think, I really believe that God started to say, hey, this is me talking to you, man. <laughs> right? Yeah, you got to go help that guy. That's one of my kids. I blew his bike off. Like Chris, the, my friend of mine, he was like one of the top bikers in Ontario. He's like, you know how to fix bikes, man. Go help the kid. Right? And I think that that's um, one of the ways that I think we can really start to hear the Spirit. And again, I think we, we want dramatic ways. Right? Like where we want this voice like, Brad, it's God. <laughs> go fix the bike for me. You know, I think like that's like our picture. Uh, I, I dream of the day that God does that for me. Brad, speak at church on Sunday. So, but I don't think that happens. And, and I, I once heard it described this way, and some of you may have heard this before, but there's this story of a man. And he was walking to his house one day, and he gets home, and his neighbor's there with all these sandbags. And he's just like piling up sandbags in front of the door. And he's like, neighbor, what are you working on there? It's a sunny day, man. Like, I don't know what you, he's like, you haven't heard yet. He says, there's gonna be a big storm. Like, there's tons of rain coming, man. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta get ready. And he's like, you know, he sees this as opportunity. Oh, you know what, neighbor? I'm a Christian. Not bad, eh? Like, you know what? My God's gonna save me. And his neighbor's like, okay. Like, well, I'm gonna keep putting my sandbags on. And he's like, no, no, whatever. So that night he turns on the news. Weatherman comes on. He's like, you know, huge storm coming. You got to get, you know, get out of town. If you, you know, save yourself, basically. Like, you got to get out of here. And the guy says, you know what? He's just like, silly weather, man. You know, I have faith. My God, he, he's going to rescue me from this. He's going to show me the way out of here. So the next morning, he wakes up, and there's cops driving everywhere. Everyone get out of town. You got to leave. Like, the rain's coming. The storm's coming. We're going to get flooded out of here. And he says, silly, officer, I'm a Christian. Not bad. I have faith. My God's going to save me. He'll show me the right way. And he's like, you're nuts. Like, I got to go. And so the next, you know, later on that afternoon, now he's on his second floor. The rain's just poured in and it's flooding out his house. And this guy comes by in a boat. And he's like, hey, you got to get out of here. Like, I got my boat. We're leaving. You got to get out of town. He's like, hey, boater man, Christian, don't worry. My God's going to save me. And he's like, you're crazy. Like, and he takes off. And so finally he's up on the roof. There's a helicopter. It's his last chance. A helicopter comes in and he's like, you got to get out of here. Like he sends the line down. He's like, he's like, you know what, Mr. Helicopter Man, Christian, my God's going to save me. He's going to show me the way. And he's like, whatever. And he leaves and he died. The man dies. That's it. He drowns in this horrible storm. He gets to heaven. God, what is going on, man? Like, you, I, I was doing all these people there. I was going to show your faithfulness. Like, why didn't you help me? He's like, well... I sent your neighbor, I sent your weatherman, I sent the guy in the boat, I sent the guy in the helicopter, and you didn't take any of it, right? And so I think sometimes God speaks to us in the simple ways. Don't ignore it. Kids, your parents might have some wisdom. Friends, people in the street, where we can hear from God in lots of different ways. It might be a prompting. It might be a weatherman. It might be a guy in a boat. If you're on a helicopter and the flood's coming, get in the helicopter, all right? That's... But I think all of that to say, I think we need to learn what it is. Where is God speaking to you in your life right now? And I think we see it in Acts 17 with Paul. Like, I think he got to Athens, and the Spirit was just saying, hey, Paul, we're in Athens, man, just me and you. Let's go look around. Let's see what they got, right? And he says, Paul, look, look, hey, an unknown God. That's me, right? That's me, man. We know that. Like, these people, they're searching for me. I'm here already with them, right? Hey, Paul, guess what? I'm going to get you a meeting with the Areopagus. You're going to be there. And when you get there, you've got to tell them about who I am. 
And I just, I get the sense that Paul, all the way through this story, is just like, it's like he's having an interaction with, with God and saying, you know, how can we, how can you use me, God? And so I think for you guys, what are the things, like, where is God speaking to you in your life right now, right? And you might say to me, well, that's the problem, Brad. God's not speaking to me at all. And here's what I'll say to you. As I said, I'm a rambunctious guy. And this is my best advice for you. You might have to go on a vacation with God, right? Where you're going to have to take some time and, and maybe you have to go out. Maybe you're way too busy, right? How many of you, if I asked you right now, how are you doing? Busy, real busy, lots going on. Hey, it's good, I'm busy. And it's like we, we kind of pull it. Jeremy talked about this, right? Like where we take busyness on. And I think one of the things that maybe you need to do is to say, okay, God, I'm going to take an afternoon. I'm going to go for a walk. I'm going to leave my phone there. I'm going to bring my Bible. And I'm, I'm going to talk with you and I want to hear from you. And so maybe that's something that you have to do. I think one of the, the, the more difficult things that we, that we learn from Paul and I admire about him, and, and in my work with Young Life, I would say this is the thing that causes me the most anxiety of all, and that is uh, when I have to go up and, and try and explain to kids who have never heard uh, who Jesus is, try and explain that to them. And I think uh, it's probably one of the, the most difficult things that we see, and I think what I'm talking about is that moment where Paul says, as some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring, right? How can we start to bridge the gap? How can we explain to our friends who know nothing about Christianity who Jesus is? And the question is, like, where do we even need to start? And I think, um, you know, I think what a lot of us would say, like, yeah, you know, I've been a Christian a long time. Um, <laughs> this is funny. I was talking about this with Jeremy. He says, Brad, all you're doing is shaming the people. But I'm going to leave this in anyway. <laughs> because he says, he says, you know, I think the sad thing for me, right, like when I grew up, I don't think we always know how to explain our faith very well. It's hard. It's really, really hard to do sometimes. And, 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 I, and so Jerry said, great that you've identified the problem, Brad, but you've got to give them some help, man. Pull them out of the water. I'm like, oh, good point. Yeah, rather than, well, we suck. Let's go home. Let's have potluck. So here's my pro tips, all right? You can take them or you can leave them. I don't know. If these are things that I found helpful uh, in my life when it comes to thinking about how do I share my faith. And the first thing that's quite simple, I think, is just to practice it. Right? Like, when's the last time you stood in front of a mirror and just pretend like you're sharing the gospel. And it sounds crazy, I know, but like it's a, you think about, you know, I was a hockey guy. We didn't just start playing games all the time. We didn't just hop over the boards and get in there. It's like there was countless practice. We practiced tons of things. I, I probably spent like 12 hours practicing this sermon because I was so nervous, right? Like where I wasn't just going to walk up here. And so I think that's one piece of advice that you could do. Start with a mirror. Things are going well with a mirror. Grab a friend, right? <laughs> grab a Grab a friend and start to say, hey, what do you think about this? All right? So I think that's one of the first things I would say to you. Um, after that, look at different gospel presentations in the New Testament. Right? How are the way, what are the ways they explain it? Is this somebody that's grown up in church? And maybe they're like, you know, I'm a little bit jaded. I'm not sure where I stand. Maybe you can point them back to Scripture. Or maybe it's somebody who's never heard of this before. And like this in Acts 17 where you can look at it and go, wow, Paul did a great job at explaining to that. And I think in terms that they could understand. And so... Um, I think that's another thing that I would say is just is start to look through the Bible. We, we have this awesome thing now called Google. We don't have to search through the Bible. Where's the presentation? Just Google where are gospel proclamations in the Bible and start to look at those and start to see the different ways that these, these guys um, read it. If, if you're not much of a reader like me, <laughs> I have YouTube, okay? There's one of these. Uh, I don't uh, know if any of you ever heard of Bruxy Cavey. He's a pastor of a church uh, called The Meeting House in Oakville. And he has this awesome, awesome video called The Gospel in Chairs. And I don't know if you've ever seen it before, but if you're like, that, this is a great place for you to start. Kids, you know what? It's a YouTube video, all right? You don't even have to do anything. You just watch. Um, and I think as you observe that, I think he has one of the most beautiful ways of explaining how God pursues us and what his love's like for us. So I think that's another great place to start. I think uh, another thing that we think about, uh, I think we put immense pressure on ourselves. I don't know how many of you experience this. I'm going to share the gospel. I hope I say the right thing, right? What if I say the wrong thing? What if I say something that's stupid, which sometimes we do? I did. I said that oh, Jesus is an alien. That's what she came up with. Um, but I think that one of the best forms of communication that we have uh, and that we don't use enough uh, is just listening, right? Ask a question and just listen. Take the pressure off yourself to feel like you have to say the right thing. Like I said, maybe it's just learning, hey, what do you believe about life? What's life all about? I think that's a really easy thing to ask. And then just listen. 
That's all you had to do that day. You don't have to come back in with the hammer, with the Bible saying, well, you believe that? You should believe this. Right? If this is a friend that you've known for years, you'll probably see them the next day. And so start there. Start with a question uh, and just listening um, to what these people have to say. And I think uh, the last tip I would give you in all of this, Jeremy, I hope I'm tracking well with this stuff, is that um, I think uh, the art of a good question, right? I think uh, we can lead people to places with the art of a good question. And the nice thing about that, if I were to say, Josh, how are you doing today? Yeah? Well, that's good. (laughs) Typically, people say, how are you doing? There's a response, right? That's a conversation. You say one thing, they say the next. That was a bad example, but he might be (laughs) tired. I was going to set it up, but I'm like, ah, I don't want them to think I'm cheesy. (laughs) Anyways, I think all that to say, typically, if we were to say, hey, what do you believe about life? We get the chance to listen. They get to share with us, and they might go, what do you believe? Right? And that's the moment where we get to start, oh, I'm glad you asked. Let me tell you a little bit about what I believe. And all of a sudden, now you're in a dialogue, and you're in a conversation with people. And so, to close all this stuff off, I think for me, the question that I have for you guys, what's your plan for reaching those God has placed around you? Right? Like, do we really have a plan? Is there a, in your mind, if, if somebody came up to you, would you be ready? Do you think you'd be ready? And I think a lot of you probably would. There's a lot of really cool people in this church, but maybe for some of us, we're going, oh, geez, I don't, you know what, Brad, I don't know if I would be ready. Right? And I think um, I would ask that, who, who is that person in your life that you feel like, you know what, if we had to be honest, we waited a little bit too long to open up this conversation. We say that a lot in Young Life where we say, you know, we want to earn the right to be heard with these kids. We don't want to be coming in there and start getting down and harping on them too early. So we want to earn the right to be heard. The problem is uh, we can be guilty of, you know, oh, I'm just still earning it. Oh, I'm going to earn it a little bit more. Oh, I'm just, just still working on earning it. It's like, well, if you've been to Hawaii with them on a family vacation, I think you've earned it. Like you're there. You, you've arrived. And so um, I think uh, my suggestion, you just start small. A simple question. Hey, you know what? We've been friends a long time. I'm just curious. Like, what do you believe about life? Like, that could be, that could be as simple as it is. How do you think? What, what do you believe about this? How did this all get started? Um, some of you might be saying, well, you know what, Brad? I, I honestly don't know if I have anyone around me in my life. Maybe, maybe I don't. Maybe I, I don't know if there is people that I, that I, can, that I can reach out to. And, and I think there's a, little, there's a little line in this passage that I love where it talks about Paul at the start. Um, and he said, uh, where, day by day, uh, he met with those who happened to be there. And I love that about Paul because I know for me, I'm like, okay, I'm going to put A plus B equals C. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a system together. But I think there was something that's really cool about Paul, and I think that I would encourage you guys about too, is just to think about who is, who, who's God placed before you that's, that you see every day? I say this to our kids in Young Life. Who's the kid that's in three or four classes, and you sit beside him every day, but you've never talked to him? Right? That that might be somewhere, that might be a good place to start. And you might say, well, you know what, Brad? I've been, I've, I've been around this a long time. I've tried. tried it all. You know what? I'm just kind of kicking my feet back. I'm going to wait till I head on up to heaven. Like, I think I'm, I'm probably over this. Or maybe you're feeling jaded. Maybe it's, you know, one of the things that's hard, rejection. You know what, Brad? I've been rejected way too many times. I, I, I can't go back there. And the thing that I love about Jesus, and, and that's been true of my life, is that he's a God of pursuit where even when I didn't want him and I was running in all sorts of different directions that he never stopped pursuing us. And so I, my encouragement to you guys, go on a vacation with God. Talk to him. God, this is hard. This is really, really hard. And I think maybe one of the things you could say, God, I need your help with this. Right? I'm going to need a little bit of help. And I think, uh, you know, the last thing, some of you might be sitting here and going, you know what, Brad, this is all brand new news to me. Right? I've never heard any of this stuff before. I, I'm like those people in Athens. I'm really not sure. Uh, and my encouragement to you guys is, you know, you could grab Jeremy. He's a smart guy. Go talk to Jeremy. <laughs> no, but um, come back and visit, right? If you came with a friend, hey, I want to know more about this. Get into a conversation and enjoy the journey um, of getting to know who Jesus is and what he's all about. I think, did I, I went over my time? Probably? Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll say a little prayer uh, to close us off for the, this morning. Father God, we uh, thank you so much for this morning and the chance to be here. Um, Thank you for the chance to be a part of this family uh, here at MCC. 
And Lord, thank you that we're all at different points in our journey that we can learn from each other. Um, and Lord, I pray uh, over this, everything that we've talked about and learned this morning from the example that Paul gave us, that if we think we've done too much and we can't even be used by God to know that it's not too late, that God is a God of redemption, um, that if there's friends that we feel like, oh, I just got to give up, it's not worth it, uh, that you would spur us on uh, to keep going, uh, that you would uh, open our eyes and our hearts uh, to your spirit, that we would learn your voice and understand where you're guiding us, and that uh, when we get to those situations, when we feel that, that turning in our hearts, that we wouldn't let that opportunity to go by, that we would take that pressure off and that we would uh, be able to trust in you and to learn from you. Uh, and Lord, I pray that you would help us to put uh, these things into practice, that we could make a, a significant difference uh, for your kingdom here in Muskoka. In your name, amen.